All right. So, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Gustav Nilsson Kotte, and I work for a company called Jayway in uh, Malmö, Sweden, as a developer and architect. And I'm going to talk about the Microsoft websites and a lot about transclusion. So, let's talk about the problem that I want to solve. This is a picture of Hegel, by the way. Quite unrelated, but um, anyway. So, the problem that I want to solve is how can we develop a website with multiple teams? So, different business units need to make a website together that should feel like one website for the end user. So, for example, in a retail domain that I will have throughout this presentation, you have products, you have the shopping cart, you have the checkout, recommendations, reviews, user profile, editorial content, etc., etc. So, this will be some form of partitioning with teams and following Cummings law, etc., etc. Uh, so, how should these teams be working together? So, first of all, like if we partition these uh, problems and, and or business units, uh, mirror them with the architecture, we have these verticals. Uh, microservices, uh, self-contained systems, what you might call them, um, business verticals, basically. But then you have this big front-end thing uh, before the actual end user sees anything. And that's a typical bottleneck, because if the business units want to have something delivered, they make, make this great recommendation engine, um, they need to wait for the front-end people to, uh, to implement their use case, and a queue will form in line. Um, the queue will be longer and longer, probably, because it's a bottleneck. The team will be larger, and uh, yeah, not good. Uh, not a problem for small uh, companies, organizations, but when the organization is uh, larger or is growing, this problem will be more important. So, I think that services should have their own front end, and this is very much in line with the self-contained systems uh, approach by uh, with uh, Stephen Tilkov and the other people behind it. And this enables continuous delivery end-to-end -end for the business units. So, but we also need uh, something else, I think. And we need decentralized governance. Uh, if you have read uh, the article of microservices uh, by James Lewis and Martin Fowler, there's a, um, there's a uh, segment in that that deals with decentralized governance, that we ha have, shouldn't have a centralized standard of how we do things. Um, I, uh, so there, there's an option for teams to have choose different tools for different problems. Uh, just an option. So you shouldn't be it shouldn't be too extreme. Like have ten ten different solutions. But at least we have an option for the future or for now. Uh, and this allows for us to have heterogeneous heterogeneous systems, plurality, diverse systems, whatever you want to call it. I think that this is even more important in the front end because there's a higher rate of change uh, in the web front end, at least. So we have all these new libraries, all these new way of doing things. Uh, and if we want to evolve over time, uh, and we want, I think we need to allow a diverse, uh, diverse tech stack and uh, having multiple ways of doing things. If you only allow one, we need to make this full read-write every now and then on, on the front end which is bad for business and maybe fun for front-end developers, but I don't think, I think that developers every, uh, every time should think about the business, business case and business value that they actually deliver. Uh, if we are doing things on the web, we also need to think about the browsers, right? So, uh, and mobile devices are on many, on, in many, uh, on many sites, more, have more requests than desktop sites, desktop browsers today. So we need to care, care a lot about mobile devices. Um, Adios Mani from Google made a uh, great blog post just uh, a little while ago where he uh, did a performance, uh, performance measuring on um, how good uh, JavaScript web apps actually are and how, what, what's the problem. And uh, on a Motor G4, so this, this is a low to middle and mid and uh, mid range. Uh, Smartphone. It's about 150 euros. Um, so, in order to show anything on a cold, cold start, uh, it took a little more than three seconds. But the problem is that we have this almost 16 seconds time to interactive, where the user sees things, but he or she can't interact with the page because the JavaScript is loading, 
Maybe you recognize this from, uh, from your own uh, experience with uh, websites and mobile devices. Um, I guess many of you have like, more high-end phones, smartphones, iPhone, uh, more expensive Android. But that's not, general for, that's not for the general public. Not of everyone have these expensive phones. So we need to think about, if we need to think about uh, what market segment we want to target. If we only need high-end high segment, maybe there's another story. But even on desktop, uh, it took eight seconds on a fully usable, to be fully usable on a cable connection. So that's not good either. So we need to think about this. So microservice websites, um, for me, is about these, these three constraints. Uh, that we need support, continuous delivery for the business units. We need to have cent decentralized governance. And we need to have good performance for mobile devices. So what's, um, what are our way forward for, this, uh, for building things that have these, satisfy these three constraints? Let's do some analysis. So we have a um, we have had two use, two use cases uh, that I want to support that will make it easier to understand. So first we have a shopping cart that is a multiple teams using one shopping cart. So in many different business units, we want the shopping cart to be available and visible in all times. So how can we reduce uh, this shopping cart between different parts of the site? Um, I mean, re reuse is sometimes good, sometimes bad, but it would be weird if every team re-implemented the shopping cart in every site, right? Uh, so I think reuse on the back end and the front end is a bit different, uh, different dynamics. If we reverse it, we have the landing page use case, which is that, so the landing page is often the most visited page on a website. And many teams and business units want to be uh, present there, want to be visible there. So we have a one-to-many relationship there. Um, and it's, yeah, it's like the opposite of the shopping cart. So let's like, go up 10,000 feet and just look down and, at this problem. So we need to do some form of integration uh, for the shopping cart, if we take that as, a, that as an example. So we need to decide on what we want to integrate on. Either data, which is like API calls, code and data, uh, like having a library that you, um, that you expose, and uh, that's using the API so that you don't uh, have to rewrite that code. And then content, which is just HTML. That you, here's, here's what you need to display. Here's the, for the browser, basically. And then when we, need to, we should integrate this, either on build time or runtime, and then where, uh, on the client or, or on the server. And if we build uh, the Cartesian product of these variables and combinations, we get two, 12 combinations, and let's just go through them. And it won't take that long, I promise. So uh, here's that Cartesian product table. So first, what? Uh, data APIs, data, uh, integrating on APIs. I think this is a no-go, because it's no use at all. It's only API usage, and we need to re-implement the shopping cart for every team. And yeah, not good. So what about code? Either server-side, client-side, JavaScript, PHP, etc. So build time, this doesn't enable, this doesn't support continuous delivery. Because if someone is using our shopping cart, and we want to make a bug fix to that, other teams need to bump the version of that shopping cart. So we can't deliver things rapidly, right? Also, if the shopping cart is written in, uh, for example, a client-side framework uh, like React, and the products team are writing uh, something in Ember, suddenly we have two frameworks libraries that should be loaded in the browser. And so if we have problems today with like one framework, and mobile performance, what about two frameworks? What about three frameworks? Think about the landing page. How many frameworks will be loaded there? So, and also we get the, the continuous delivery problem of, um, yeah, let's not go into that, but release trains and all the other things. Not good, um, either on the client or the server side. So runtime then. Um, I think that runtime and the dynamic and on the client side is 
quite interesting. So we can, I think, actually get continuous delivery there. It's a bit more complex. But still, we have no support for diversity and performance, like React for the shopping cart, Ember for the products, still the same problem. So we haven't really solved uh, anything with that except maybe continuous delivery. And then uh, integrating on runtime on the server is just uh, very weird if you want to support different, maybe on the JVM it will be okay or with .NET, but different, I, I can't even imagine what this, this combination is like. So it's just, let's not think about that. And so integrating on content and HTML on the build time on the client side is also a very weird combination. combination. So uh, that's also not applicable. But then on the server side, if you integrate on build time with HTML, that's actually like integrating um, like static pages, static fragments. So that could work and could actually be quite good for performance. But the shopping cart is user-generated content in some way. Like the user buys a product, and he, he or she wants the product shopping cart to be updated. So wait, there's a lot very limited amount of use cases that we can use this for, and basically not any dynamic data at all that the user sees as, as dynamic. So then we have these two combinations left. Uh, integrating on content uh, in runtime, client and server side, and this, this is client, client and server side transclusion. And so let's investigate these combinations and talk about Transclusion. Again, this is a picture of Hegel. <laughs> okay, so transclusion from Wikipedia is the inclusion of part or all of an electronic document into one or more documents by hypertext reference. Um, so, as with, with all integrations, um, we have a producer that uh, it's easiest to think that we have a, a fragment, just a part of a document, even if transcription in, in theory uh, is valid over full documents. But the producer exposes, exposes a uh, fragment resource, for example, a shopping cart. And the consumer then includes the fragment declaratively, similar to just including an image tag, an image. So all of you today, if you have used the web, if you have browsed the web today, have, you have been using transcription without knowing it, because images on the web are transcluded in the browser. So we're using transclusion every day, every time you browse the web. It's just that we don't think about transclusion with HTML. We more, more think about it in terms of transcluding, transcluding images and maybe videos. And so again, transclusion can be made both on the server side and client side. And uh, my examples today will be edge side includes on the server, and client side, uh, I will use H include which is a custom element library for client-side transclusion. But first of all, something that you need to think about if you use transclusion. And that is that if you have a reference to another uh, resource, like an image, you c the URL to that image can't be relative to the producer, because the con it's, it's, it's a different context. It's the consumer's context that you need to think about. And the consumer, if, you, if you're lucky, the doors are the same, probably not. So you need to uh, think about um, what the consumer's world would be like. So that means that you need to, if that's possible, have root relative URLs uh, if you're on the same domain. If you're not on the same domain, you have to use uh, absolute URLs. And absolute URLs, it's a bit sad, but it's the only way forward for uh, actually addressing something that's not relative to you. Okay, so that's just uh, something you need to think about. So, edge side includes, um, looks like this, like an image, just uh, including a, an URL and uh, a mechanism, the, the infrastructure will replace that, uh, that XML tag with the content of the response of the HTTP request. Uh, so ISA is a uh, proposal from, uh, that was submitted to uh, W3C 2001. It still have, hasn't been accepted, so I think the chances are pretty low that it ever, ever will. 
but at least I think it's a quite stable standard or yeah, language tool, whatever you say. So, and the CDN support for this are, is not super great. It's Akamai, which was part of creating the standard proposal, and Fastly. Uh, the on premise support is uh, way better. So, you have, uh, you have Varnish, you have Squid, you have some libraries like Node ASI for Node.js. You have plugins uh, for Nginx and Apache, and the list goes on. So on-premise is quite, is quite nice. I mean, on-premise, I mean, you can have an um, Amazon instance or whatever that has that uh, hosted in this uh, infrastructure as well. So um, on the client side, the, the, the way to translate there, uh, there, are, there are more options, I think, libraries that does this that do this. Uh, Mark Nottingham wrote a library in 2006. He has be done a lot of web, standards, web standardization. And he worked at Akamai at the time that he wrote asynclude.js. And the last year I did a simple port of uh, that library to, uh, to support custom elements, uh, which is a web component standard. So basically the same thing, but different interface, and uh, also supports Transitive, transitive includes, that if you include something that contains an include, uh, it will just work, but performance will not be great, so you should avoid it. Uh, and with, like with ESI, it looks basically the same thing, but it's, it's on the client side. The interesting thing with client side translation is that since we now, in more and more browsers, have support for HTTP2, we have um, not the penalty of having multiple AJAX requests um, performed for every inclu inclusion tag, because browsers that support HTTP2 will also uh, use the same connection, if they can, with, with multiple AJAX requests. So this is an enabler for have, doing more client-side uh, connections, basically, if the browser is, is, uh, sees that it's a possibil possibility to do that. Um, and just finally, a cool thing with client side includes and client side translation is that you can actually refresh the translator content. So you can, uh, on an event or polling or something else, just refresh the shopping cart on a user interaction or similar, which is not something you can do with ESI includes. So that's, that's a full page. So, which one should we choose? Quite a lot of uh, uh, text. I won't go through it all. But basically, the pros and cons of the server and client-side transclusion is basically just inverted, uh, except for one little thing. So with ESI, the browser doesn't know that you're using ESI, because it's just the server-side uh, rendering. So search engine optimization will work as, as normal. Uh, JavaScript and CSS references will just work. And uh, initial performance will be good and you have the ability to make cross-domain requests because you're on the server side. But um, there's also a bit of an extra infrastructure investment uh, that if you're, you're doing the on-premise thing, you need to basically have an extra component, infrastructure component, that you need to uh, take care of, basically. Also, the development perspective, if you want to run the, the system and integrating uh, on your machine, you can't have Akamai on your dev machine because it's a CDN. So you need to make like an, a mirroring of uh, that infrastructure. So Node ESI I, I used quite extensively. It's, it's good. It's great for like, the simple cases. Um, so it's not a big problem. It's just a little bit of lead time. Um, something regarding performance. ESI will, in most implementations, not stream the responses send response to the client if you have ESI tags. So it will perform all the HTTP requests that's needed before returning, which is nice if the servers are responding fast, or if they're not responding at all, because then it's also a fast response, right? But if the servers are, are hanging, then the load time for the page will be the maximum amount of time that any of the servers hangs, right? So then you can add timeouts to, to an attribute uh, in, in an attribute to the ESI tag, but still, if you have a two-second uh, 
timeout as max, you will have a max uh, load time for two seconds. Maybe that's okay, maybe not. It depends on your, on your context, basically. And also, the last thing that's a bit of a problem, maybe, with ESI is header forwarding. And I'm thinking about cookies here. Because ESI is basically a proxy, um, doing proxy calls to servers. But usually a proxy has just connection to one server, so header forwarding is not a problem. But now when you have two or more servers, you can actually overwrite the, the HTTP headers between the proxies. And this, this, the way it will be overwritten, if it would just be a default, would be that the, um, the, the, the order of the requests uh, will be, it will be basically indeterministic. So that's why I think it's a quite a sensible, quite sensible default that not having header forwarding turned on by default. But it can be configured, uh, and there's a script online how you do that in Varnish at least. And I think Akamai is also, also has some support for that. Also has support for that. So uh, on the client side, it's just reverse pros and cons basically. Except that if you don't, you need to think about. Like images, if you don't specify an initial width and height, you will get like a zero pixel image. And when the image uh, is loaded, the page will jump up and down, basically, that old web problem. So if you can, you should specify an initial width and height. And this is more and more important the higher on the page you are, because below the fold, below the screen, uh, whatever that is, you don't, you don't notice that. So I think the higher up the page, more ESI, and then below you can have more dynamic things. So <clears throat> which one should we choose? Actually, you don't have to choose because you can use them together. So you can uh, inherit from the hinclude uh, component, custom element, uh, and just do an H include that does nothing when it's initially loaded with like four, six lines of code. So this means that you can wrap uh, the fragment responses from the server inside of that H include that does nothing. And then uh, integrate that fragment with ESI instead. So you're having server side initial content for the shopping cart, but then when someone adds something uh, as a product to shopping cart, you can refresh the shopping cart dynamically with client side, or with uh, with this uh, refresh. So it's a nice can be a nice combination of both initial performance and actually doing some dynamic stuff later. Another combination is that uh, using this H include that does nothing, just refresh support. You can use like a library like HuntJS, which is uh, detecting when elements entering uh, the viewport, the screen, and have a little offset of uh, 400 pixels. And when el those elements that are just just uh, Asian include uh, just empty references, basically, they are, they're just references that hasn't been included yet. You can get laser loading very very simple by, uh, by uh, using this sm small amount of code. So what I mean is that you can have like a long, quite long list with products, and maybe ESI include the first 30 of them, and then the rest can just be dynamically included as the user scrolls. So again, like a ba balance between performance and uh, um, how much you get. Yeah, you can combine uh, both client-side and server-side includes, basically. Which to your to for fun and profit. So, long story short, for, to satisfy these constraints, a continuous delivery, decentralized, decentralized governance, and good performance on mobile devices, the first rule for integration, for what as I think microservice websites, is that you should transclude um, server side resources, either on the client side or on the server side. So server-side resources are generated. They are, yeah, they are templated server-side. OK, so now we have another problem. What about client-side dependencies? 
we have the shopping cart HTML, no problem. But what about additional client-side behavior? Like, what happens when you, yeah, progressive enhancement, basically, uh, what happens when you uh, click this or that? You don't, you, you don't want full page refreshes for every interaction, right? And then, how, what about the design? How, it will be nice if the shopping cart was not like in Times in Roman or like, you, you know, or just uh, looked very weird. So we need to think about this as well. So we need to import service dependencies um, that we have on, the, for example, the shopping cart. So we still need cache busting. How many of you know about the term cache busting here? So maybe less than half. So it's basically where you cache client-side resources for an infinite amount of time, and then you just change the name, uh, the reference to an, a new resource, and then you cache that for an infinite amount of time. So a very simple cache mechanism that works, that works great uh, in many ways. So if you don't have this, then how would, how would you... Uh, yeah, it, it, gets, it gets complicated, and this is the easiest way forward for, um, uh, for always getting new, new code for, uh, in every particular perspective. And service-side transclusion works very well here. If you, transclude, if you want to use client-side, uh, if you don't have access to service-side transcription, things get a bit more complicated. Um, so I think for a, a real production scenario, you, you, you will need... ESI or server-side trans server transcription. Um, it, yeah, it gets messy client-side, either with HTTP directs or with uh, dynamic loading with JavaScript. Uh, won't go into that more, but you should use server-side transcription here. So how, would, how, this would look, will, how this will look is that um, in order to use the shopping cart, you will need to include uh, another reference in the, in the head. And uh, like way way back, uh, we used to put script tags in the bottom, uh, just below the body. Uh, body it was closed, but with the defer attribute, uh, which is supported above IE10. So if you need to support IE10, you can't use this approach. You need to have two imports basically. But with, if you can use the defer attribute, you can just have one ha one uh, client side dependency uh, client side dependency include. So it doesn't matter how you how granular you want to be here. If, if you want to import, if you want to have granularity of like of team granularity of components or set of components, it doesn't matter so much. It's a it's a mechanism that I want to talk about, and it's up to you to decide what the granularity is uh, for you for you. So so here we have the ESI include for the resources for the shopping cart, and after inclusion. It will look like this, uh, and the shopping cart is uh, is visible. So this, just to be clear, the resources here are they are in control of the shopping cart, the retail team. So they are in control of the cash busting. So this will be cash busting as a service, basically. So you just include the resources, and things will work. <laughs> If that team would not be in control of cache busting, you would not get continuous deployment, right? So we have JavaScript resources and CSS resources, at least. With JavaScript, we can't make any assumptions of the consuming services client-side dependencies, like we had before. If the shopping cart uses React, it, it, can't, it can't assume that any other service that uses the shopping cart will also use React or underscore or a ver typical or a version of jQuery or, or what, whatever. It, can, can, it can't assume anything because if, if you assume that, you will get some form of coupling. And maybe that's okay for, for smaller things, for larger things. You can't, you can't tell the whole enterprise to say, wait a minute, we need to stop what you're doing, we need to upgrade jQuery. <laughs> like it, it, but for small things, maybe that's a, 
that maybe that's uh, maybe that's okay. So that means that you need to use vanilla JS, which is JavaScript without any form of libraries or frameworks. And vanilla JS, since you don't have templating, it's it's not a it's not a great way to work with JavaScript. Basically, it's a lot more complex, complicated to actually do something useful. And if you look at the source code for for other custom elements that um, that yeah that exists, there's a website customelements.io or something like that. You you see that they they have this assumption. That they can't make an assumptions of what what the consumer have, right? Maybe they can add say that you have to need you need to have jQuery enabled, but I mean that's a limiting that limiting the scope of usage for for the amount of consumers. So vanilla JS and polyfills browser uh, standard polyfills, so that you because these you can actually rely on that they will be at least available in the future time some sometimes, and the polyfill is just like a way to fill the gap. Uh, between a not so modern browser with a modern browser, and you can't polyfill everything, and it's not free to polyfill either. So you need to use both vanilla JS and polyfills with uh, a bit of respect, and there's no free lunch. And just want to point out that custom elements simplifies the lifecycle of components quite a lot, and there's a polyfill for for that called document register element, uh, which is just 5k. So it's cheap and it it works well and there's so uh, yeah it's very 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 small so that's good so what about CSS so I am not a CSS expert uh, just want to point out that so any advice I give you now you should basically not <laughs> you should not listen to me now <laughs> yeah but if I just want to uh, assume something and um, so I think that large-scale CSS development is really hard. That's my impression, at least. Um, and like decentralized large-scale CSS development is probably even harder. Don't know. But do we have any an alternative if we want to do scale? If we if we make a, another team that's just responsible for CSS development, we will get the bottleneck that we don't want to have, right? So you can try to have an open source model like Bootstrap. But you will get the same kind of dynamic there. That oh, I need to add this component. I want I want this to work this way. So I think uh, yeah, it's 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 complicated. But I think that having a style guide um, that tell in some form there's a there's a small book by I can't remember her name. But uh, there's probably more books about style guides that you actually have some kind of uh, guidance of how you design things, and that you have a common language. It's basically a ubiquitous language for design, for graphical design. Um, use namespacing components, responsible web, flexible. You don't really know about the, the consumer, so be careful. But uh, I don't want to give too much advice. The good news is that other people have this problem too. Because like if you big a really big, big single page application in React with multiple teams, um, they will also have this problem. So there will probably be more resources on, on the web uh, how you can deal with these things. So, yep, just browse the web if you want to uh, find other uh, find good options. Probably, I think that f for me having Dependency on no, no, having no client side dependency on CSS is like, I think that's a good, just, just as with JavaScript, you can't assume that you have any CSS available, except for maybe a, a reset and maybe some typography like what font are we using and what, what does font size mean, what, what is on H, H1, H2, etc. So that a very, very tiny amount of CSS just to have some common ground. Um, but that's optional. I think that would be a good idea. So, uh, for microservice websites, in order to um, fulfill these constraints, continuous delivery, 
decentralized governance and uh, good performance on mobile devices, we add one more rule, that we have no global client-side dependencies. Okay, so let's have a quick summary of what I've talked about. So I think that, again, I think that services should have their own front-end. And I've showed you that how you can do that and integrate with translation technologies on the server side and the client side. And again, here's the here's that that page. But what 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 will you get if you don't have a decentralized governance? Um, I think that's the that's the constraint that most teams, or companies, or organizations don't really think about when they want to do this multi-team multi multi um, architecture for, for websites. I think that you, you get into that occasional rewrite thing that, oh, we, we wrote this thing in Angular, we have a microservice thing, uh, architecture in Angular, and, uh, but now we're, Angular is not new anymore, we want to upgrade to Angular 2 or switch to React. So, but all these business units now need to make a project for migrating. Since you're only allowed to have one framework, you need to do this full rewrite of, of the UI. Maybe you can keep the CSS and uh, like the HTML, um, how the HTML looks. But in terms of JavaScript, you need to make that full rewrite, which is I think very bad for business, and I think if we can avoid, if we can see in the future that this rewrite will be necessary, I think if we have the if we have the means to do it, if we do everything we can to to avoid having that kind of future. On the server side, we I think market, the market, market service uh, culture is much more uh, mature in some way. It, we are, Always the service side, service side people is more mature <laughs> often than the client side. And we have, we have um, uh, built a culture of a more longer period of time. On the client side, we, have, we are uh, quite many years behind in some cases. Also, I want to point out that the rules for integration inside a boundary context or, or team or, or vertical you are free to use whatever you want, because if it's isolated, if the first vertical is using Ember and the second vertical is using React, it doesn't matter, because they, they don't need to talk to each other. It's just that users that go between there will need to load uh, some extra JavaScript when they go between the different sections. The thing is, when you export things, you need to be very, very careful about what you assume that the other side will have. So this is just for exported fragments that you can't have any dependencies um, for that. So if you maybe you th have, have thought about like how so we have so this this Gustav here is talking a lot about server side, but how you actually get good UX out of this? And the thing is that you can get get UX out of this. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you think that good UX is a lot of JavaScript, if you are inside a vertical, there's no, uh, you can choose whatever style you want, if you want to use progressive enhancement or big single page application or whatever. But the way that these verticals are talking to each other, uh, that's, the, that, that's where you have a lot more constraints because the way the way we want to scale over, over time and over, over the business and being able to have continuous delivery and support mobile devices. So, there's, uh, I wrote in an article uh, called Market Service Websites this summer. It's quite long. I think if you print it, it's 32 pages. So it's, but um, it's, it was received quite well and has qu had quite a lot of views. Um, where I go through this in much in, in more depth, basically. Um, there's a Mac service article, article again by James Lewis and Martin Fowler. Safe Container Systems by uh, Stefan Tilko and uh, um, yeah, more people. I don't I don't even know. Yeah, 
how many people are involved in that, and maybe it's open source too. Uh, there's a nice talk that kind of ties into this, that's called Architecture Without an End State by Michael Nigard, and uh, the, uh, which talks about polar, polar heterogeneous systems and decentralization. And uh, this is, ties into what I want to do on the front end. Also, the JavaScript performance linked by others many. And this is a great book, The Principles of Product Development Flow, second generation lean product development. Just want to point it out. I'll have a chat on Twitter, and maybe now it's time for questions. Yeah, so. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Time for questions. Um, thank you for the talk. Very inspiring. Thanks. And um, but in the end, um, I think about when one team starts using React, one team starts using Ember. Then in the end, I'm still at the same point I was before when talking about performance on mobile devices. And yes. And um, when I exclude this and I'm telling them, okay, just use vanilla JS, and then every developer, especially when I uh, bound agencies or whatever, they tell me we can't do that. Or we start building our own framework for solving all the problems that other frameworks are solving for me. So, <laughs> yep. um, what's the message <laughs> about this in the end? Okay, so, so the message is that if you... So, so that's and problems that you will have if you want to fulfill these constraints, right? So, and as, as I see it, going back to that big table of uh, different possibilities, if, if I would have found another, another style of architecture that will solve this problem, if you, if you have any suggestions, please, like, because... Uh, the more options, the better. I, I'm not religious about server-side templating or anything. I just haven't found any other options that that, sat, that satisfy this this like organizational uh, case. So, if you have problems with agencies, or if you have problems with uh, like pedagogical pedagogical problems with developers that don't want to write in vanilla JS. And I think it's really hard to write good code in Vanilla DS. That's that's just details, basically, because you can't work around it anyway, right? You have you have to resolve these uh, conflicts and try to explain why why you need to um, why you need to work like this. And for people that don't understand that, they need to be inside a box. For people that understand that the the dynamics, they can be. Uh, crossing the boxes and making integrations, right? So, so please, if you if you have a better solution, please do submit a talk for the next micro exchange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you for presentation. Um, do you have like any experience and any observation around passing authentication and authorization information to these services uh, providing content? I can imagine a situation that. Uh, when you're in the shop, shop, shopping basket and user is not logged in, uh, you display one content, and when user is admin, you display different type of content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do you have any experience in that? It's for me, it's really difficult subject. Okay, yeah, um, and I think that if you the retail web server, I mean the. Um, Authentication, cross-service, is a com complicated topic in itself. So I don't know if your question was about that or just the integration of the web, uh, web thing. More about passing, passing headers. Yeah. Okay, so if, if you configure, uh, for example, ESI, if you configure ESI to have header forwarding, uh, if we f assume that Lo that below the front end, we actually have uh, have uh, good authentication mechanisms. Then, if you just use, use uh, let ESI pass the headers, mm -hmm. uh, you will have the same uh, the same uh, mechanisms that you will have okay. anyway. So that's that's the key that you need to uh, 
fix header forwarding in h side includes yeah, basically. And, and, and in client tr uh, translucent, does it work similarly? Like uh, client side. In client side, yeah. Yeah, because that's uh, th that's inside the browser, mm -hmm. so you need to think about the course request mm -hmm. that uh, that you have. You can't make cross domain requests, but if if you work around that, uh, and there's there's definitely a problem anyway. Um, the cookies will be seen by the browser like any other cookies. So in that case, it's actually easier on the client side with uh, authentication and cookies. Okay. Headers. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so, I mean, in the end, everybody should use um, modern client libraries to develop web applications if you want the application to be usable for users, if you want to not kind of annoy all your developers. Um, so, in reality, all those verticals will have like the same or different um, client libraries, um, and not doing that will probably just make render the entire application unusable. So that's kind of how reality looks. What reality reality looks like, and isn't like the hard problem how to how to get microservices in there and um, why why do why would you say that um, just kind of copying the code on the client or merging the code on the client or on the server um, solves any of the problems you stated in the beginning, like um, load time, for example, or mm -hmm. like being able to continuously integrate without um, hurting code or hurting things from the other verticals. So, so what's, the prob what's the problem that uh, you, will have, you want to have one, one, the same framework in all the business units? No, I'm... I'm, I'm you're right that that usually doesn't work in large-scale corporations or in large-scale systems, but um, isn't that the problem? Isn't the problem how to work with potentially different libraries? And, yeah, sure. Um, that, that's that, if if that problem would have been solved, yeah. that you can have that you can upload an, a large amount of JavaScript to the browser, and it wouldn't be a penalty for, for performance. That would be. Uh, a big that will be a big enabler for um, doing something else than this, but I think that like how can you execute code that you don't have right how exactly but that, that's why I would say that this doesn't solve the problem because in reality you can't ship like react js angular and ember to any client because then the page will stop working because it's just too slow so um, also, forcing your um, forcing your developers to only work with vanilla vanilla JS will just end up with very poorly written copies of those frameworks. So, um, I, I would argue exactly. that uh, that this is not a not a solution to the problem you stated. So, shipping many frameworks for the same page is what I said that what I, what I tried to explain that we shouldn't do, and what I talked about is a, as a way that would evolve, avoid that. So if, if you're thinking that I want to promote having multiple frameworks libraries on the same page, I think you misunderstood what I said. So we, we, can, think, we can talk afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much. Very interesting stuff. Um, you said uh, one of your goals was uh, this decentralized governance. But nevertheless, uh, someone has to do all the work you just described to basically integrate um, the, the contents. So what are your experiences? Who, who should be doing that and who, who should feel responsible? In terms of that? roles or? Yeah, in terms of is there a dedicated team for that or are there people in all these vertical uh, pillars that feel responsible okay. for that? Or? I, th I think that um, in terms of like organiz organization in itself is also a, a complex topic. But if you think of an example from uh, the Spotify model with squads and tribes, chapters and guilds, um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, I think that integration cross verticals will be done in a chapter. Uh, maybe talk about that in a guild as well. So you have like a web development guild that you talk about these things, and then um, cross, yeah, in the chapters will be cross squads. So that will be the place where you talk about uh, uh, the integrations. And not everyone will probably be developing these integrations. Um, 
So I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so thanks again for the talk, and now it's time for lunch. Okay, thank you.